Have you ever considered all the gifts of pregnancy, orgasmic birth, and parenting? We often spend more time, right, stressed and worried and afraid about pain and fear and what lies ahead than really embracing and celebrating the gifts and miracles of birth and parenting. My guest today has a very personal story of both orgasmic birth and the joys and blessings of birth love, connection, and parenting. Her story has deeply touched me, and I hope today it will really touch and inspire you. Hi, I'm Deborah Pascali Bonaro. I'm director of the documentary Orgasmic Birth and host of the Orgasmic Birth podcast. And I'm so honored. You can probably, those of you that are watching us can see that I'm in Bali with someone who's really special and dear to me. We've met each other like years ago. We've been on this journey of birth. So I'm going to read a little bit of her bio. So Lean is a mother of three, a mom of two, married to her soulmate. And after the birth of her son, she felt the calling to be a birth keeper. She is a birth and end of life death doula, a doula trainer, a pregnancy yoga teacher, a hypnobirthing teacher, a birth photographer, and vice president of the Belgian Federation of Doulas. After the beautiful orgasmic birth of her own children, she wanted to experience the magic of pregnancy and birth one last time. So they decided to be a surrogate family. So it is truly such a pleasure and honor to have you joining us today to share some of your journey with birth. Well, it's my honor to, to join you at your podcast, Deborah. It's a true, true honor. I'm so excited to be here. And um, well, yeah, it's uh, Orgasmic Bird was one of the first movies I saw um, when I was doing pregnancy yoga in my first pregnancy. Our pregnancy yoga teacher, she showed us the the movie of Amber, I think, oh, was yes. in, the, in the movie Orgasmic Bird. And I was like, I want that bird. <laughs> <laughs> so I went looking for it. And then I, uh, I saw the pregnancy of the, the whole movie as orgasmic bird and it inspired me so much. And well, I had through the three of the beautiful, most beautiful experiences in orgasmic bird. But thanks, mo mostly thanks to you too. So yeah. That. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear, right? We never know when we made the film and all our materials, how it ripples out. So it's always nice to hear when it touches people. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Like each of your births have been very unique, right? Birth is special and Definitely. unique every time. If you would have told me like 10 years ago, you're going to birth at home, I would would have like said to you you're crazy you go to hospital for birth but then when I was pregnant with my son I felt this immense responsibility come over me and I've never been been a big reader I never read a lot of books but at that point I read all tons of books and a friend of mine uh she said she had a home birth and I was like oh I didn't even know that was a possibility and um I went to have a talk with the midwifery practice who, who do, does home births. And after that, it was amazing. The difference between the care I got in hospital, I was rushed through appointments with the OBs and with the midwives. They took like two and a half hours for my first uh, appointment. So I felt so at ease and so at home. And I was like, OK, I'm going for a home birth. And the birth of my son uh, started quite different because my I had a, a rupture of the membranes and I was losing uh, amniotic fluid and I was like okay this is not the way I was imagining my birth to start and I called my midwife and she was like yeah well you have to like uh, the, the birth has to start and in Belgium it's like a rule when you're in, well, you have ruptured membranes, you have to go into labor within 24 hours or else they will induce you. And I did not want to get induced. I have, I've heard stories about induction and if it's like a medical necess necessity, I, I'm totally for it, but I didn't want that. And I asked her like, okay, 
I'm a big asker of questions. Like I Good. really want to want lots of information. Like why do they want to induce you within 24 hours? And she told me, well, it's because of the risk of infection. And I thought, okay, how can I prevent infection then? Like don't have sex, don't take a bath anymore. Make sure nothing goes up there. Like even no um, internal exams. And I was like, okay. So I talked to my husband with uh, about this. And I also asked the midwife how high the percentage of infection rate was. And we decided together, like we made the informed choice to wait, to wait it out, to have my son be ready for birth. And we, well, I went on like a week and I had to go to hospital wow. every, yeah, yeah. My midwife asked me like, could you please go to hospital every day to check uh, if your, your baby's doing fine, if you're not going to have an infection. So we went to hospital every day. And my, my regular OB was in, at ho in holiday at that point. So I got another OB and he asked me to take um, um, antibiotics just right. to make sure I wasn't having an infection. I wasn't having any trouble, but he asked me just in case I would get an infection to have uh, antibiotics taken, but he just gave me the prescription. Okay. So I could still make my own choice. Good. And then after a few days, I think it was after five days, my OB or after six days, I think my OB came back. So we had an appointment with him and he was like, okay, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to go home. I want to have a home birth. But my midwives, they tell me like, don't think about it too much. Like just relax, try to go into your oxytocin bubble. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but I have to go to hospital every day, like being traffic to the hospital, being traffic back from the hospital. So it's kind of hard not to think about it. And then my OB said, well, okay, it's Monday now, Monday, like around lunchtime. If your baby's not born by Wednesday night, then you come to the hospital to get a checkup again. So I got two whole days to just be at peace, to just relax. So it was a beautiful day. It was March 31st in 2014. I remember not a time to have nice weather in Belgium, but it was a beautiful day. The sun was out. It was really like soft temperature. So me and my husband went for a walk around the lake. And there at that point around the lake, my, my membranes totally ruptured. So it went all the way. And still there was nothing happening, like labor didn't start yet. But then I called mid, mid, the midwife and the midwife said, like, go home, relax. We went home. We had the best night ever. We had so much fun. I don't know if you know SingStar uh, on, on PlayStation. No, PlayStation, I don't know. Well, SingStar, it's a singing uh, game. game. We were singing. We were having so much fun. And I had the best night's sleep for the whole pregnancy. I never had that good of a rest before. And at 8 10 I woke up crampy and I'm like okay I have to go to the bathroom I, I went to the bathroom okay it was just cramps like okay false alarm but then 10 minutes later another cramp like okay, okay maybe this is it and then it started and I called my midwife I don't know if any <laughs> woman ever called you like being excited that they're in labor but I'm having contractions and the whole day we were like in our bubble, in our love bubble. We were by ourselves the whole day, like just moving around, walking on the ball. Like I covered all, all the clocks because I didn't want to know the time because for me it was very important. I didn't want to feel like, oh my God, we've already been going at it like a few hours. I didn't want to know that. At around three in the afternoon, we called our doula. I didn't know it was a doula at that time because it was my pregnancy yoga teacher. And I asked her during pregnancy yoga, could you please join my birth? Because your, your voice is so soothing. And we just like take all of the different positions. And like, I felt the urges come, but it was not hurtful, but it was like this immense power coming through me and I was like so in awe of my body I'm, wow my body's doing it and at one point um, my husband ordered dinner for him at that point I was going close to transition so um, my doula did the hip squeeze you obviously yes. know the hip squeeze and I was like oh 
keep on doing that. It was <laughs> amazing. The, the, the relief I felt from the hip squeeze. So from that contraction on every contraction, they had to do the hip squeeze. And then we moved to the bathroom. I went into the bathtub. We have a really be beautiful big tub in our old house because we were in our old house back then. And I remember my doula sitting next to the bathtub, just like meditating, like the vibe was really soothing and very beautiful. And a few hours later, the midwife arrived, but I didn't know that at that time, but my husband and my doula were stressing out because he was taking a long, quite a long time to get there. But I didn't notice I was in my love bubble. And yeah, like at 12 hours, exactly 12 hours later than uh, contraction started, my boy was born into the bath beautifully at home. It was an amazing experience. And after that experience, I was like, if I can do this, I can do anything. So I quit my job. <laughs> I looked up doula trainings because I <laughs> then knew what a doula was. And I, I felt the calling to be a bird keeper. It was, yeah, it changed my life totally. It was so transformative and so beautiful. Thank you so much for no sharing and so much wisdom in that to have taken the time that you, your baby, your body, your partner, you all needed to let labor unfold on its own, right? Definitely. definitely. I think it's so, so important that people inform themselves. And for me, it was, well, I've always been kind of rebellious and always like asking questions like, why? Like, why is this a reason? Or why is this a law? Or why do you have to do it like this? And if I agree with it, then I'll go with it. But if I don't agree, I will find a way to like go in yes. between. So I don't think it's for everyone to stay with ruptured membranes for a whole week. But if it feels safe for you and you feel like you've asked all the questions, you know, all the st statistics, then you make your own choice. I yes. think it's so important to make informed choices. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the biggest part for me of orgasmic birth is that you're birthing in your way with the information that you need and then the collaboration and care of that team around you, right? Definitely. That circle of support. So after that birth, how long was it till you were pregnant again? Um, my kids are two years and three months apart. So close. It, yeah, they're pretty close, but it felt like amazing, like perfect. Uh, we were so happy to be pregnant again with the, well, at that time, we didn't know what it what, what is going to be like a boy or a girl. So we, in the first pregnancy, we knew it was going to be a boy, but the second pregnancy, I didn't want to know because I would love the surprise at birth. And the pregnancy also, it was such a magical time with my son too. But also with my second, it was so magical feeling a baby like forming in your womb, moving it like I've my mom is like that, too. She said, like, I've never felt so good in my body as during the pregnancies of you guys. And I'm like the same. I feel so connected and so in love with everything and everyone when I'm pregnant and also, well, body shaming is a big issue these days and when I feel pregnant I feel so sexy and so sensual my body is forming and I I love being pregnant I I, I yeah it's yeah. just it's not that's a reason why I made it my profession <laughs> to work with pregnant women that's so, right right yeah. but I hear you I mean when you say that that fullness of life right the creative energy that just mm -hmm. is flowing is amazing so when you were, you know, starting to plan a second birth, did you do anything different from the first time? Were there things that guided you now that you wanted different or? Well, there was a big difference. I was a doula. So after this, the birth of my son, I enrolled in a training, a doula training, like different doula trainings. I got in contact with the, the president of the doula, the Belgian doula federation, we have in, in Belgium, we call them doula cafes and it's a gathering of doula. So I had a lot of doula circles. So I had a whole doula and bird keeper community like uh, behind me. And I felt it was like different because I had in the first, I had a lot of information, but now I had all the information. So that was the difference. I was already a doula, 
but I realize now that it's also kind of uh, a trap because you know so much, you know, and with my second, the bird, they, it started in the afternoon. I got uh, waves and I went to the, the store and just kept on doing the things I was still needing to do. Like I, <laughs> it was a Friday and on the way to the store, I ran into a friend, but I was already having surges. So she was like, wow, you're, you're like quite far in the pregnancy. When's the baby coming? Well, probably soon, like, <laughs> like, like today in my mind. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't tell her because I didn't want her to know it was today. But yeah, it was really, really funny. And then uh, we went home and like, again, going for a home birth. But this time we did... Um, uh, I buy. I bought myself uh, a birthing pool because the bathtub we had was pretty big, but not quite big enough. I couldn't move freely around in it. So we had a birthing pool. We set up the pool. We made our house like really cozy, put all the lights and the midwives arrived and the midwife listened to the heartbeat uh, of the baby and the heartbeat was too high. It was like in the 180s. So she was like, okay, if the, the heartbeat of the baby stays this high, we have to go to hospital. I heard the word hospital, my labor stopped. This, that, that also like so strong, your mind like takes control of the whole process. So I didn't want to go to hospital. So the word hospital like was there and my labor stopped. I, I started crying. My husband and I were like, okay, we have to go to hospital probably. But then I started to asking the questions again. I was like, okay, but why is the baby's heartbeat that high? And the midwife who was with us was quite unexperienced. She just started midwifery practice. So I called my midwife from my previous birth and she was also coming to the birth, but as a second midwife. So I called her and I asked her like, why would the baby's heartbeat be that high? And she said, well, we don't really know. We cannot see in your womb, but it can be a really stupid thing, like a hand being attached to the, the big artery in your neck. And when the baby descends in the pelvis like that, that can make the heartbeat go really high, but it also can be a more serious problem. And I was like, okay, but if it's the first, then maybe can I first use the rebozo together with my doula to shake the baby out of the pelvis. And she was like, yeah, that's actually a good idea. Do that and I'll go, I'll come on my way to you, your house and then we'll decide together. Look, okay. So I went upside down, like I, we were in a sofa like this. I went with my knees on the sofa, head down on the floor, like totally bum up. My doula put a rebozo around my, my bum and she started shaking like crazy. She was shaking like she's never shook before. Okay. <laughs> and she did this for about 15 minutes. And the midwife listened to the heartbeat again. And it was around 170s. So, okay, let's do that again. Okay. Like going back down, she shook, was shaking it again. And I'm still so grateful to my doula that she, she did that because she did it for two times for 15 minutes. And she was like, exhausted yeah it's after a lot that, of work. After that. and the second time I was down my second midwife arrived and after the 15 minutes we took the heartbeat of the baby and it totally went back to normal wow it totally like balanced out and we could we were able to stay at home we didn't have to go to hospital so my labor picked up again how are we going again and after a while my second midwife was like you're talking too much because I was a doula and in between the surges, like my doula, me and the two midwives, we were talking about birds. And I would have loved someone to say to me at that point, like, Lane, you're not a doula right now. You're just right. a birthing mother, but it didn't happen. We're talking about birds. So my midwife said, like, I'm going upstairs to have a rest. If you stop talking, then I'll know it's time to come down. And she was right. She was totally right. I went into, at one point, mostly I go into the, the water when I'm in transition, when uh, the pushing stage is going to start. So I went in the water again and uh, the baby was born in the water. Beautiful experience again, so transformative, like, wow. 
and uh, yeah our little girl was born it was a girl uh, our girl was Emma and uh, yeah it was an amazing experience too and uh, after that birth I had a bit of trouble like um, transitioning into mother of two um, because I felt I was like only a mother like the the rest of me was like disappeared for a, a bit so I had a pretty difficult year after Emma's birth but still the birthing experience was amazing and after that I felt like we always my husband and I we always wanted three or four children but after Emma's birth what with the year being quite difficult I I, I went for help I went to, to, to a, a therapist yeah definitely so important so important I had body work done and I found, refound myself. I became a doula trainer, um, and I found my passion of life. And we always said that we wanted to have three or four children, but then we were like, okay, no, we feel that our family is whole. And then I was like, wait a minute, my pregnancy with Emma and the bird was my last. I don't want that. I don't want it to be last. No, I, I, I haven't been like saying goodbye to the magic of, of pregnancy and birth and the transformations. And oh my God, I want to do that again. But I don't want a kid anymore. Like, oh my God. And I started thinking and I was like, okay, maybe I want to be a surrogate. So I told it to my husband, asked him, what do you think if I would say to you that I want to be a surrogate? And he was like, you really have to. I was like, okay, that's a good question. Do I really have to? And we took our time to feel. And after a year, we really felt, well, I especially really felt that, yeah, I really have to, like just to make the circle round and, and to have it all line up. And he was like, okay, then I, I can see and I can feel that you will not be truly happy if you don't have this experience so we, des we decided to uh, become a surrogate family. And um, yeah, it was a beautiful and amazing process. I still feel like the first time we met the wishing parents, um, there are two, two, uh, two men, uh, a gay couple, and they, the first time we met them, um, it felt like falling in love with two other guys, like with the permission of my, my husband. I always tell this the story and it really felt like that and we made an agreement like we are going to take a whole year to get to know each other to know what what what's yeah what, you're putting a child into the world together so it's really important that you have a connection and you feel good with each other and I think it's important to explain that surrogacy for especially for me but I also realized for a lot of uh, surrogate moms in Belgium and the Netherlands is quite different from America. In America, it's all often um, commercial uh, yes. surrogacy. Yes. And that was not the case with us. And it's even um, um, like uh, illegal in Belgium and in the Netherlands to have a commercial surrogacy. So we met each other in February, 2020. And in March, 2020, we all know what happened. COVID hit and we had lockdown. But it didn't really matter because we were a lot on Zoom, like, thank God for Zoom. We had lunch together on Zoom, like us in, in our home, there in their home. Uh, we went on a holiday together. We did really fun activities together. Um, and after Christmas 2020, we started to, um, this, we started the insemination process. Um, and not the insemination process most of you think about in hospital, because if I don't have to go to hospital, the word hospital stopped my labor, right? So I don't really want to go to hospital if I don't have to. I love hospitals if it's a necessity, necessary. definitely. But I didn't want to, if it, I didn't have to go, I didn't want to. So we did a home insemination. We did it ourselves. And it was a beautiful process. I well, I asked my husband if he wanted to do it, but that was a bit uh, bridge too far for him. So I respected that, but I did it by myself. Um, I made a beautiful atmosphere in my room. I had pleasure at it, of course. Uh, I had music. I sang mantras. 
and I welcomed our uh, our baby into the world. And after three months, I got pregnant. Yeah, yeah, we were so happy making plans for the future. But then after 10 weeks, we lost the pregnancy. But even that experience made me realize that the connection we made together with the wishing parents was the right one. And also it brought me like, I was really sad and it was a really mourning process. And for you out there who have been through this pregnancy loss, please talk to talk to people and don't have it bottled up. Like make sure you talk to people, make sure you reach out maybe to a doula, a birth doula, a dead doula, like have someone support you in this process. Because it was for me, it was so, so, so healing to have that community around me. Um, I called a lot of my girlfriends and also of my doula colleagues, and I had a morning circle. Um, we had 10 women in a circle sharing their experiences with loss. Um, and it was so healing. It was so amazing to share those experiences with other women. And then I, um, I caught the, the baby when I lost it. I wanted to to catch it and I wanted to bury it ceremonial so we buried it in the backyard and uh well in the front yard actually actually and I put a, a butterfly bush on it and actually my my son's placenta is also buried in the backyard and there the there's also a, um, a butterfly bush on it and it's growing really big it's amazing but it, the one that has been planted on the pregnancy loss it stays small so it's beautiful how nature also feels like all these, well, the symbols, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So that was our beautiful. experience with loss. Yeah. And so important, you know, to honor that. I really, I'm glad you're sharing this because a lot of times people don't share their loss and your wisdom that, you know, whether it's after your second baby where you were struggling a bit or after a loss, we've lost the rituals, the connections in communities. And, you know, as doulas, we always say when you're feeling down, that's the time to speak up. And Definitely. so important that in both cases, and you really found a community and ceremonies Definitely. to support you. Definitely. And I felt really after this experience it brought me so much more than it took I was really sad and I was really like crying a lot but even though it was a really um a sad part of my life it enriched me so much it brought me so much one of the mothers I've I've um I've been guiding through the years she lost a lot of pregnancies and a lot of babies and I guided her through those two. And she told me after this experience, this is going to make you an even better doula than you already were. And that's so true. Yes. I, I, I love that she said it. And it felt like that too. And then um, a, we lost the baby in uh, the end of June. In July, we took a holiday together with the, the parents and that, well, that experience, like going through loss together, it made the connection even that that much stronger. And in September, we started inseminating again. And after a few months, I was pregnant again. And this pregnancy was the most like I had beautiful pregnancies and births with my kids. But now I was like, it's going to be my last one. Right. So I pulled out out of all like, <laughs> I pulled out everything. I had the, the fathers were so good to me. They made sure I didn't lack any care. I had massages when I wanted them. I, ha I went to the osteopath when I needed to. Uh, they 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 took me shopping for maternity clothes. So it, I was so so blessed to have so many people caring. And like like my my midwife also said to me like you have three men taking <laughs> care of you, and that's true. Like I remember a time being like really really pregnant like just sitting in my sofa at home and just taking a picture of my my husband and the two fathers in my kitchen cooking for me it was yeah it was amazing and um I made sure that everyone who was going to be in the room was at ease with birth 
And in the meantime, I became a hypnobirthing teacher because after uh, my second pregnancy, I took extra courses and extra workshops. So I did hypnobirthing and I was really like curious if hypnobirthing would add something to my birthing experience. And I had I, I took a hypnobirthing course myself again. I already was a hypnobirthing teacher, but I took it together with my husband and with the two fathers. So we took a hypnobirthing course, the four of us, with, with my doula and uh, made sure that everyone who was going to be in the room trusted the birthing process because I think that's so important. Like everyone in your room, everyone in your birthing space brings their energy and if there's someone in the room who's scared or is not really sure about the process of not really sure about a home birth then it can affect you as a birthing woman so i wanted everyone to be like totally relaxed totally trusting the process and it was beautiful the night before i remember i was i told the baby like okay we're gonna be pregnant 42 weeks right because i want to like enjoy it fully to the fullest and I was 40 weeks and two days. And at the end of the day, at like 9, 9.30, I went to bed and I sat on the side of the bed. And at one point, I felt a snap and I was losing water. I was like, oh, my God, I think my membranes just ruptured. But that wasn't the agreement. You were going to stay in until 42, right? <laughs> So I called the midwife. Uh, I told her what happened. She was like, okay, no, there weren't, I didn't have, I wasn't in labor yet. And I called the fathers. And I was like, guys, I think it's time. My, me my membranes just ruptured and you can choose or you come because they live like an hour and a half from us. I was like, you can come here already and you can just stay in the, the room where I'm going to birth. We had a bed for them there. Um, or you can just wait until labor starts and be like, no, 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 we'll start right now. Like they were like so nervous. Like they left immediately. They uh, arrived at our house in the middle of the night, but we had the room like set up for them. I went to take a shower. Uh, one of my midwives came to check if everything was okay with the baby. And I was able to sleep a few hours. Yeah, the wow. labor hadn't started okay. yet. I felt that I had like, small surges maybe but I was like mm, I don't think this is it yet so this feels totally different and because of the hypnobirthing I really knew every detail that was going on in my body and that felt so reassuring knowing what happens in your body takes the fear away and not that I ever was afraid of birth but even knowing what your body is doing what your womb is doing the muscles they are working together that felt like, okay, this is not labor yet. This is just normal. But I was actually in labor. I didn't realize I was in labor. So I went to sleep, had a few hours of sleep in the morning, woke up, called everyone again. I was like, okay, now I feel that labor has started, but it's really very, very slow. And during the pregnancy of this baby, I was like, okay, I want to have my rest and be grateful phase. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this phase. It's when you are fully dilated and your body or your baby says like, okay, hold on a minute. Let's just take the time to relax for a minute because there's another really important phase. The pushing phase is coming. It takes a lot of energy and we need a rest. So surges, they slow down. They're not as forceful anymore. This is, more, th this is uh, in hospital, a lot of the times the phase that, um, the medical staff says, look, your surges aren't like your contractions aren't strong enough anymore. So you need help. We'll give you some extra Pitocin. And when you respect this phase, it's just your body needing a break. And I really wanted that one because in my first two births, I didn't have them. I really wanted them <laughs> because I had that phase of transition. I was like, okay, I'm so tired. I don't want to go on anymore. I just need a break. But I didn't get the break. My body was like, nope, we're going all the way through. And I was like, okay, this time I really, really want uh, a rest and be grateful phase. And also at one time I attended the birth um, of a woman who um, said at one point, I can feel my baby turning. Is that possible? 
I was like, yep, yes. that's possible. And I was like, wow, that's amazing that she can feel the baby turning. I wanted that one too. So I got it. It was amazing. The bird was going on. Everyone was there surrounding me by love. I was dancing, going on the ball. And at one point after trans, like going into transition, at one point I was on the ball and a song started. And it was a song I um, sent to the mother who lost the baby and also a song that was played at a funeral of a friend. So I hear the song. I start crying, the tears running down my face. I felt my father who passed away in 2019 with me. I felt my ancestors with me. It was so strong. And at that point, I cried and I went into transition. And when I was into transition, there was the rest and be grateful face. So I lay down in an aerial yoga hammock. The father's like caressing my back. My husband is there caressing me. My doula is just rubbing my hairs and like, I felt so loved in that moment and it made me go into like the pushing face so, so easily and so beautifully. I went in the tub, most powerful push pushing face ever. <laughs> and then Felix's head was born <laughs> and he was like, you want to feel my head turn? Oh. I'll let you feel it. Oh. He turned left. He turned right. He turned left again. He turned right again. I was like, okay, now you need to pick a side. You need to come out. <laughs> so he came out. He was born. And it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Um, after his first breastfeeding, I handed him over to the fathers. I was in my birthing pool looking at the fathers with their newborn baby on their chest. And I was like, okay. How can anyone ask me? Like a lot of people during this process asked me like, Was, isn't it going to be hard? Aren't you afraid you won't be able to give their, the ba them the baby? And I was like, no, I'm not scared. I really feel that his soul chose me as his portal to come to this earth, to be with his fathers. And I was sitting in the birthing pool, really relaxing, having a golden milk. My doula made golden milk for me. And I looked at them and it was such a beautiful picture. My birthing photo uh, my uh, photographer made a picture. It's like a painting. Yes. It's so immensely beautiful. And I was like, oh my God, sorry. A beautiful butterfly, butterfly. just just passed around. Right. And I'm like, I us. have something with butterflies. Oh my God, uh, that's so special. Yes. So yeah, it was amazing. And it was the right thing. And it felt so amazing. And I had my most beautiful experience to say goodbye to the magic and the transformation of birth and pregnancy. Oh, I have to give you a hug because for everyone that's listening, I've had really the honor of watching this beautiful birth unfold, your photographer and the video that they put together. And you can't help but like, when we watched it, we were all just crying and sobbing because it is such a gift for you. It was a completion of your kind of cycle, Definitely. but it also such a gift of love to everyone that participated. And it just really is incredible because your story touched me on so many different levels. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, it feels like that too. Like it's not only a gift to them, to me, but to the whole world, like just putting love out there. I think it's so important. We were talking about it yesterday. Like don't fight against things because that's a really aggressive energy like fight before things like go like and have like spread love and and be kind yes. and you'll get so much more done with kindness and love than with fighting and aggression so yeah that's yeah. beautiful oh, gift of you. love and we're here at our ipre doula retreat in bali so Definitely lots of love flowing, Definitely. but I want to thank you so much for sharing all three of your journeys with pregnancy, birth, love, life, and connection. And for many people listening, they may want to be in touch with you and take your courses, or if they're in your region, hire you as a doula. What's your website? How can people find you? Well, my website is www.doulalene.be and lean is L-E-E-N. 
Um, and they can, all can also find me on Instagram, uh, social media, and it's just Dula Lane. So Dula and then my name, L-E-E-N. Perfect. And that'll be in the show notes. So depending on where you're watching or listening, look below and you can contact Lean. And thank you so much again for sharing and inspiring. For those that are listening, you know, we always love to hear from you. Tag both Lean and us at Orgasmic Birth on Instagram. What touched you most in Lean Stories? Um, what's coming up for you. And we thank you so much for joining us in Bali today for this episode of the Orgasmic Birth Podcast. And we hope that you'll subscribe, review, and join us next time. Thank you so much for the invitation, Deborah. It was a true honor. And you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. We went over.